Hello and welcome to episode 79 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is February 10th, and together with Robert and Goran, we are here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hello. So it, it has been quite some time since we last talked about Azure NetApp files. Today, we want to pick up this discussion again. And this time we have Geert with us, who will share some updates and latest news on Azure NetApp files. But before we um, hand over to him and, and start our interview with him, let's quickly, as always, take a look at some of the news from this week. And I want to start with um, a new blog post series by Martin, not our Martin Pankratz that we had on the show several times, but this time Martin Frick from, from SAP. And he has started a really beautiful blog post series about um, SAP and Teams integration. So um, right now we are at part three. So part three was just um, released today. And um, he, he really goes through the, the project or the process of actually um, what what does it mean to integrate in, in this specific case, SAP success factors into Teams? And he, he outlines um, what are the, the required architecture settings and what do you need to configure? There is um, also a GitHub repository available where um, you, you can get all the, the, the sources to get started. And then he really guides you through um, yeah all the things that you need to do to set up um, um, the, the success factors integration in Teams. And as mentioned, there's now um, um, blog post three available. So here's the third one: requirements, implication, architectures, and it's just a uh, yeah. I, I think you can, you should definitely follow along and create your own um, um, integration into into Teams. I think it's really powerful, and um, obviously you you might have seen already some some um, solutions from SAP and Microsoft: the SAP Sales Cloud integration, the SAP by Design integration, which is already available in the um, Teams App Store, and um, by following Martin's blog post, you can now also create your very own um, integration in, in Teams. The next thing that I want to highlight is um, a recording or a webinar as part of the SAP Garage um, um, series. Um, now in episode two, I think we also mentioned um, the previous episode one. I actually, here you can still see it. Um, um, uh, with with Harut from from SAP talking about um, yeah creating a custom mobile app um, here in in episode two um, Max uh, Max Streifenader is actually fr from SAP is is actually talking about how to set up um, yeah or how to route traffic if you have um, multiple instances so for example in the case of cloud integration when when you have you can have one actually let me um, jump over here. If, if you have one instance, then that's fine, obviously. But what about if you have two instances, maybe because of high availability, disaster recovery and stuff like that? Um, well, then um, using Azure Traffic Manager, um, you can use this for a load balancing um, between uh, the different um, CPR um, um, not cloud integration um, tenants here. So I think it's a really nice um, episode. You uh, can also read through um, a blog post from from Max. There's also a GitHub repository um, available that guides you through these steps. So I think this is very relevant if you are using the business technology platform and you um, need to route the traffic between um, different instances, then this approach makes a lot of sense. Um, the next thing is an um, interesting public preview. And Goran, you, you said that you might even be able to uh, do a quick demo on the Azure Bastion um, now supporting yeah, file yeah. transfer. I like it. I mean, actually, I saw it. I haven't had time to try it. And actually, I just tried 10 minutes ago, 10 minutes before we started the session and kind of worked. It worked. <laughs> and I perfect. really love it. Um, so let me let me just quickly share. Um, just quickly share the screen. The point is typically when I, you know, when when I work, uh, um, I mean, in Azure, um, we work, of course, in a very secure environment in Microsoft. And typically, you would you you get a screen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I would I would you know we need we are not allowed to have any kind of um, public open RDP ports. So what we would go, what we would basically do, you know, we would go to the uh, to the virtual machine and we would go to the something called Bastion, 
which means then it will ask me to my uh, to the username and I will put some password and basically using the Azure portal I, I click connect I will connect through the RDP session or the Linux SS, uh, SSH session as well in a secure way but it would run in a browser right mm. um, however um, it's not always convenient way it's a secure way okay but it's not for me also convenient way and also I mean I can't typically if you have an RDP uh, session you could um, copy from my local desktop to the RDP the files for example as well yeah. I mean copy text works but it's it's not always kind of ideal so basically what I had to do you know there is a new preview version how you can enable this feature uh, basically to use the native client too, meaning in this context in RDP. I, I tried just RDP and need to do it in Linux. It was very kind of easy to execute few um, CLI command commandlets uh, mm -hmm. on the, um, uh, on my local Windows client. I had to also configure the, the bastion also to change it. So to say, OK, use the standard and use the native client support. OK, mm -hmm. and then I, I uh, what I sorry the wrong window all is kind of like this, and basically what I just execute in um, uh, Azure CLI. Okay, that's like how it's documented. And I said, okay, now connect me to that virtual machine right over that bastion. And what is happening now is starting an RDP client. Okay. Okay. So it's going, I don't know how, but through some magic, it's going through the bastion in a secure way. It's not the public. I mean, the, the whole stuff There's is- There's no protected. public IP address that you're no connecting. No public IP it's address. So that's the first, first tr trick, right? Um, so no public IP address. It's uh, only through the best. Bastion has its own, of course, but it's then fully secure. It's somehow through some magic goes through, through the bastion. So for my uh, comfortable work, I love to use the RDP because it gives me also a kind of full uh, flexibility in some way. So again, that's that's the same. And I would and next stuff so I can spread the win, 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 window, which I won't do it now. But let me just open some local temp folder, okay? And let me go. This is my uh, local yeah. uh, um, Windows Explorer. I have some file, okay? I just open it, you know, okay, long live SAP on Azure YouTube channel, of course. <laughs> what else? So I just do click select, click copy, and then jump into RDP. Ah, and cool. Space, and here you are. And now, so via RDP, via Bastion, you can yeah. now yeah, drag yeah, yeah, and drop yeah. files, basically. Sure, sure. So same stuff should be possible, as they said, on um, through the SSH client. I just need to try it. But in 10 minutes, I could do it in a private cool. preview and love it because I can just stretch it now. You know, I, I'm yeah. I'm stretching the whole stuff and that gives me definitely much more comfort what I need to, to work in the RDP than I had in the browser session, let me say. I so, agree, I agree. Yeah. For, for yeah. me, that's also, I, I mean, I love Bastion, but you're always in this browser window. Of course, sure. you can go sure. full screen or whatever, but but if you now really have RDP support, that that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. So cool. maybe interesting tip, but helps uh, to still work in a secure way, but also have some kind of more comfortable way to do yeah. this stuff, right? And do cool. more stuff like copy the files, which is typically for a RDP session possible, right? Perfect. Okay. So, so I think that's that's not only the announcement here that it is in public preview, but we Small saw minute. it now live. It's really working. So that, that's Small also minute. cool. Ten minutes. I could do it in ten minutes. Perfect. I also need to do this in in for my Bastion yeah. instances. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's quickly continue. Um, there there's another thing. Um, I think we talked about this. What the heck? Um, uh program or or uh, repository um, where um, basically from the fast track team there's a huge amount of of content of small hackathons basically that that cover yeah uh, a huge area of, of of topics and and the idea is that these these documentations here guide you through um i don't know virtual van setup or or um, i don't know iot edge scenarios and the idea is that you can take the content here 
and do a small hackathon. And and yeah, at the end, you, you really know how, how this is working. And there is a new one um, called um, SAP on Azure Application Modernization that guides you through um, the, the, the process of, well, yeah, setting up an SAP in environment, looking at all data as an, um, on, on APIs, making a secure um, single sign-on connectivity to this, to this, um, um, to the system, looking also at events and, and even an integration with, um, with logic apps. So I think this is a really cool hackathon. And, and obviously here, the, the, the usual suspects that, that we had mentioned so many times that also were um, to some extent already on the on the podcast have um, worked on this. I think this is some something really cool that that's definitely worth um, to to check out. Cool. Um, then another interesting blog post that was released um, yeah a week ago almost that's um, protecting Microsoft SAP workload with Microsoft um, Sentinel. Um, so we had talked about um, Sentinel in the past. We, we had um, Joav. Um, um, joining us, uh, talking about what Azure Sentinel is and and uh, how it actually, uh, yeah, can can be used in the context of SAP. And here in this um, post or in this blog post here, they, they are they are talking about well, how does this work really, um, yeah, in 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 more detail with um, with the SAP solutions. How um, can can we do from um, how are we using this from Microsoft internally? So um, Microsoft Digital, how, how are we using this um, to protect our SAP workload? And I think this is a really cool um, scenario. Again, talking obviously about um, eating our own do dog food, really um, looking at um, our own lessons learned in this and, and um, um, providing feedback to the product. So that's, that's a really cool um, blog post that, that talks about um, Azure Sentinel at, at, at Microsoft in the context of SAP. The last um, post that I quickly want to highlight is um, in German. So it's a it's um, a new format that um, will start. Uh, yeah, here end of March. So it's the Microsoft Business TV, um, mainly targeted at, at, at partners and there in, in some short um, sessions. Um, yeah, the the, um, the the colleagues will will talk about um, yeah, certain topics and, and present this to partners. Why am I um, highlighting this? Well, um, Robert is one of the, the, the um, TV hosts here uh, that will hopefully um, provide a lot of insights. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure about SAP and, and will help partners um, yeah, learn more about SAP and Microsoft. Well, we have a competition here. We have a competition with we Microsoft. We need to discuss it, TV. Robert. You know. But but Robert will be. I mean, he's not on the show today, but he will be back. So he's not leaving us. Uh, he's just taking up an additional um, TV fame. Good. So with this, that that was all for the the news from from this week. With this, um, yeah, we're we're happy to have Geert um, with us um, in the show today. So maybe Geert, before we go into the topic, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself. What are you doing? Um, what's your your yeah, your history coming, coming yeah. to where you are today, and then let's kick Absolutely. it off. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Holger and uh, Goran, for uh, for having me. Of course, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's uh, I've been following the podcast for a while, and uh, you know, it's 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 nice to be now part of the part of the gig, really. So I really like to uh, like it to be here. Really cool. So my name is uh, Geert van Teilingen. Um, I'm the product manager or one of the product managers for Azure NetApp Files. Uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the the storage service that we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, in this in this podcast. Um, I, I'm obviously part of a larger team of uh, product managers across the, let's say, Microsoft and NetApp Alliance. Um, I, uh, I I'm now at at NetApp uh, at, as part of the product management team, but I was at uh, at Microsoft before as a as a global black belt for advanced storage, and before I was at Microsoft, I was at NetApp uh, for uh, ten years. So I've been ping ponging back and forth between the two organizations, if you will. Um, I actually wear two hats. I'm part of the, the of course of the NetApp team, but as as equally as part of the the Microsoft team. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm more than happy to be in the call here. Uh, Cool. It's really great to have you. Um, I mean, it was a lot of fun um, working with you in the past as a as a global black belt, and now I'm really happy to have you back here uh, as a as the product manager. 
Yeah, yeah it's funny. To, it's funny that you say that. Actually, I was uh, thinking that my last business trip was actually when I was still at Microsoft. That was two <laughs> years ago, <laughs> and then this little virus came along, and then uh, you know it locked us in, and uh, I haven't been traveling since. So uh, I think I'm uh, I'm a cheap uh, traveler for NetApp uh, from a NetApp perspective. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I have opportunity to just now work together with Get. On a one big customer migration project, European one, so with the Azure NetApp. Yeah, so world is. Yeah, we might get to talk a, about it a little bit, at least from a technology standpoint. So let's uh, let's technology. yeah, let's kick it off. Yeah, and and let's actually. I mean, we mentioned now Azure NetApp files a few times, and and actually we we already had I think a year ago some some sessions with Ralph Klar who who talked about um, Azure NetApp files, but. What is it? So Gert, maybe maybe you can talk a lot, little about um, what is Azure NetApp files? Yeah, and that's an interesting question because let's say at first glance you would think about Azure NetApp files, of course, as okay, it has files in it in the name, it has NetApp in the name, uh, probably some sort of storage, right? And uh, of course, fundamentally, that is the case, right? It's a, it's a storage service in Azure, but there's a lot more to it, right? So, and and we're trying to achieve a lot more than just provide let's say a place to store bits and bytes of uh, of data and uh, i think it's best explained if i can kind of share my screen a little bit uh, i got a couple of slides to kind of set the scene and then we can uh, basically uh, take it from there and uh, let's let's see if if we can get this to work uh, uh, obviously uh, properly uh, you you, ne you never know if that's going to work uh, out of out of the gate but uh, i'm i'm sharing my screen right now here right no let me yes. let me yep. let me redo that again let me redo that again because i got the wrong slide there real quick so let me put that slide up, right? So what when we're talking about my Azure Net of Files, then we're really talking about a migration enabler or even more, even more so a complex okay. workload enabler, right? So what we want to do is uh, create an ability for customers to, to run workloads in Azure that are previously deemed unmigratable, right? So that's why we call it migrate the unmigratable, right? So so to in order to get to put that a little bit in context, I think it's good to kind of start with where we started, let's say four or five years ago when uh, when we start building this technology in the in this alliance uh, together, right? So it started with what we call files in the cloud, right? So that's the context, right? If we, if we look at, uh, let's say this, the situation five years ago or four years ago, which is still true probably today, is that the majority of enterprise workloads are running on premises, right? So even now, I think more than two thirds of the applications still run on premises, even though the cloud has been you know, growing massively. I think the on-prem world is not sitting still either. And you know, we still have this situation where where, where data is, 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 is stored and applications are stored in an on-prem environment. Uh, and we also know that about half of those roughly um, are stored, uh, uh, let's say on an, uh, from a data storage perspective on um, an enterprise NAS or file-based storage device, right? So we have applications that rely on file-based storage and they typically run on an external storage device in the customer's data center, right? So that's kind of the starting point. And, and Microsoft basically at the time also realized that obviously these enterprises are now looking more and more uh, for ways to deploy these file-based workloads in the cloud, right? So they, we have a tendency to uh, to, or we see a tendency to migrate to the cloud uh, obvious, for obvious reasons, right? Customers want to be empowered, right? Leverage the cloud for more advanced uh, businesses. Uh, but as they want to move to the cloud, they basically do not want to sacrifice uh, specifically for those applications that they've been running on-premises for long uh, to sacrifice on a couple of key elements. And that's performance, reliability, and enterprise data management, right? So customers really look for a way to keep what they have or let's say keep the experience that they have on-prem, but find that in, in Azure, right? And also customers do not want to re-architect everything, right? So not every application landscape is suitable for, let's say massive modernization, right? Using cloud native uh, storage services or any of that sort, right? So, so as we move forward in time, um, Microsoft kind of came to the realization you know, that we, we, we need an enterprise uh, file-based storage service to fill this gap, right? So. Obviously, there's a, there's other storage services in Azure, Azure Blob, uh, Azure uh, you know Managed Disk, uh, Azure, Azure Files as well. But there was a clear need for a, a storage service that could really provide these core capabilities: high performance, low latency storage, uh, high available, uh, reliable storage as well, and, and have advanced data management capabilities. Right. So, 
that's when Azure Native Files came to life, right? So what we've built together is basically in, uh, fundamentally uh, NetApp all-fledged storage systems, uh, but as a fully managed Azure service, right? So that means that from a storage portal or from an Azure portal perspective, we're providing a storage service that gives you uh, the widest choice of file-based protocols, right? So all NFS versions are supported, uh, SMB is supported, even dual protocol volumes are supported in the various mixes and matches. Uh, but it does give you that on-premise like or on-premise class performance with multiple tiers, right? So we have ultra premium and standard tier to kind of give you a, a choice of, let's say, the, the performance scale, but it all gives you that low latency sub-millisecond response time experience that are typically required for uh, for those enterprise applications, right? So, and we blend in, let's say, the typical, let's say, data management capabilities that on, that NetApp and ONTAP technology is known for, right? So snapshots, advanced snapshots, cloning, uh, advanced replication, advanced backups. And I think we're going to talk a lot about that a little bit more as well. But fully built into Azure, right? So it's an Azure consistent experience. You, you go to the portal, you deploy through the portal, you get support through the portal, you get built through the portal, right? So it's a, it's a fully portal service. Now with that, it basically forms the fundament or the foundation, the fundamental uh, capability to provide uh, advanced or to run advanced workloads uh, ranging from just large scale file services to HPC, high performance compute, virtual desktop infrastructures, obviously databases as well in an enterprise class, uh, uh, with an enterprise class experience uh, in all kinds of verticals, right? So Azure Data Files is not limited to any particular vertical or any of any sort. Right, so that kind of is this, this sets the scene for uh, solving a problem. And what is the real problem that we're solving is that you know customers can now really transition and move those migrate of their, those enterprise workloads that are based on file-based NAS storage devices in the data center uh, into the cloud without you know having to refactor or re-architect because all of these operations are typically you know risky, costly, and time-consuming, and customers really want to have that. You know, move into the into the cloud uh, experience, and, and with that, obviously, we target a, a whole series or a whole category of uh, of workloads and migration. Uh, you know, use cases, right? So, if you look at the migration of a, you know a, a whole bunch of Windows applications or applications running on Windows, uh, SQL Server, right? So, we can really run enterprise scale SQL Server deployments with high performance, low latency uh, experience but also Linux open source applications and databases running on open source or running on Linux, like Oracle or MySQL or Postgres, really the, the, the database that you typically uh, see in a Linux environment. And obviously SAP on Azure, right? We, we are supporting SAP uh, on Azure uh, fundamentally in a variety of different ways. And we're enhancing uh, the potential, the possibilities for SAP on Azure uh, with this foundational store service. And then besides that, we also cover a variety of workloads in the, let's say the specialized areas, right? So high performance compute, uh, virtual desktop infrastructures in a variety of ways, uh, Azure VMware solutions that we're working in, uh, in into, uh, and, and as well as integrations into a variety of platforms from services as well, right? So fundamentally, migration of the unmigratable is at the core of what we're doing. Um, and, and therefore it's more than just storage. So that's kind of what the introduction is all about. I, I think that's really interesting because I'm um, honest, we, I mean, when I get in contact with Azure NetApp Files, it's always in the context of SAP, obviously. But it was really interesting um, in, in the slides that you showed. Um, SAP only came, I think, in the last slide. So, so um, th there, there's a lot of things that are completely independent of SAP, where, where Azure NetApp Files also provides a lot of functionalities um, and, and benefits um, independent of SAP. So I thought that that was quite interesting for, for me at least to see. So it looks like you have lots of other use cases as well. Yeah, abso absolutely. And and uh, I mean, if we can dive into that to a, a little bit deeper, then uh, what I could do is I could share, uh, I'm gonna share my screen still. You're uh, still sharing your screen, yeah. All right, let, let me share this uh, this screen real quick, right? So you see my browser, yeah. uh, where where I go to the Azure Native Files Docs page, right? So this is the official Azure Native Files Docs area uh, for, for the service. And in that Docs area, we have a landing page called Solution Architectures Using Azure Native Files. Now, coincidentally, you do, you do see the same diagram on this page as well, right? Where 
it, it explains the key use cases. But if I were to scroll down this page, you will see a whole a host of um, reference architectures in these uh, in these various categories, right? So I can go into Linux open source and database solutions and, and see information, reference architectures, et cetera, for Oracle, uh, integrations into machine learning, uh, mainframe refactoring, right? So there are solutions where customers want to run mainframe type applications in Azure uh, without actual, uh, uh, you know, uh, the specific mainframe uh, technology. We have uh, solutions together with uh, other vendors that, that provide that capability, right? And if I were to scroll down, you see obviously all these categories fly by uh, where we have all these reference architectures and not in, not let's say accidentally, if you go to this particular area, you see the SAP on Azure solutions, uh, let's say section, this, this is the biggest section, section of all, right? So we have a whole series of uh, solutions where we describe you know, generic SAP and network for integrations, where we describe, of course, integration for SAP HANA, uh, how you deploy uh, effectively Azure Net of Files, or I should say SAP HANA uh, on Azure Net of Files, but also NEDB, uh, and, you know, SAP IQ, NLQ, NLS, sorry. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a whole series of blog posts as well that explain a variety of aspects. And this page, and again, I could scroll down more and more. I mean, we, we can talk about all of the use cases, of course. But this page is growing every single week, almost, right? So there's always new uh, articles that are posted here in this uh, in this uh, particular page, uh, and new solutions that uh, that they're being provided. And actually, the one that is the latest one that was posted actually yesterday is, uh, or that we added yesterday is, or is going to be added, is a solution around integration of uh, Kerberos uh, encrypted volumes in an sure. SAP HANA context, right? So there's a lot of content uh, uh, for specific uh, use cases. I guess in my in my uh, discussion with customers, um, it comes first, I need the highly performance storage, highly meaning also the database, because it's very, I mean, throughput and latency, but also it boils down uh, often as the, one of the key factors, the features. So different scenario, like using, a, out, creating a snapshot out of snapshot, creating a clone of the database and for the sake of system refresh or system copy. They were doing those kind of stuff on the on-premises within on-premises NetApp and immediately they want to do and uh, the same thing and they got the feature which they needed, you know, so that's also additional typically driving motivator here to, to use the net. Yeah, see. and I can talk about that a little bit more, right? So there's obviously some some key values that we're adding to, let's say the Azure, Azure platform as a whole that enable uh, capabilities specifically for HANA, but also non-HANA databases and other workloads that, that are very fundamental. And uh, I mean, obviously from an, let's say an application perspective, we enable SAP HANA scale out, right? With with SAP HANA scale out, you obviously need shared storage in order to 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 have your failover scenarios uh, taken uh, taken into account without all these um, complex data replication uh, requirements, right? So that that's a key that's a key enabler for for that. Um, we also enable large scale uh, Oracle deployments, right? I mean, think about an, a, a 10, 15, sometimes 50, sometimes 80, or even more uh, larger terabyte uh, database instances that, that you need to run in Azure. Uh, not only do you need to be able to run that quickly and uh, deploy that in a, in, a, in a simple way, you also need to be able to scale it in a simple right, way, right? So one of the advantages of Azure Net Files is that you can scale your capacity uh, both upwards and downwards at any point in time without yeah. any application disruption, right? So if you need more capacity because your database grows, you can increase your capacity easily. If you need less space because you shrink, you can do the same as well. Uh, but not only from a capacity, capacity standpoint, also from a performance standpoint, you can scale, right? So as you need maybe burst performance, you can increase your volume size and therefore increase your performance or your bandwidth, or you can decrease it when you when you, uh, when you you don't need it, right? Or you can change the service level uh, non-disruptively. By the way, that's a good point for that. One customer we are jointly working there, they're putting, they're doing the backup, right? And then on the putting on the uh, net of ENF, and they wanted to get it faster, so they just increased the the SKU size of the NetApp and the backup will run two times faster. <laughs> 
yeah, and, and, and scale down exactly. basically. Yeah. So the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 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 the interesting part is what we, I mean, we've documented a couple of let's say uh, cost models and optimizations for that, right? So if you go to the let's say the cost model for Azure and the Files document page, we have a couple of pricing examples where we clearly paint the difference between, let's say, static provisioning of capacity and performance versus using dynamic provisioning, right? So with this dynamic provisioning, uh, you can obviously scale your performance upwards and downwards uh, when you need it, but also only exactly when you need it, you scale it back when you don't need it, meaning you don't pay for it when you don't need it, right? So th the difference here is, for instance, if I were to look at this di diagram, right? So if I, if I deploy my storage Let's say in a static fashion, you basically deploy capacity and performance, you know, for the full duration of the time. Then obviously, if your workload changes over time and you don't need the performance with a static provision, you pay for it anyway, because that's how you provisioned. Whereas if you use, uh, you know, a capacity pool dynamic provisioning, you can scale up when you need it and scale down when you need it. And that's the bar chart, right? So you can see exactly when you when you actually uh, you know, consume what you need and when you need it and only pay for it. And we have calculated the difference, right? So in, in this example, where you scale uh, dynamically, you could save, you know, 2K a month in this particular example, just by the by the, the way you're, you're scaling your performance, right? Mm -hmm. Another example is dynamic service level change, right? So you can change the service levels. And if you use static provision or let's say provision without a uh, dynamic service level change, You'll see that you that you statically, uh, you know, pay for uh, for everything at the same time. Uh, on the other hand, if you if you change your cost model by flipping between premium and standard and ultra tiers when you need it, then you can save a, a lot of money as well. And all of this is uh, is clearly described, right? So that's a, a really key advantage that that shows, let's say, or proves, if you will, the elasticity of the cloud and makes uh, you know storage capacity, but also storage performance. Elastic, and that's exactly the aim what we've tried to achieve with yeah. Azure Files. And also pay as you go, depending on what how much you're buying, right? So you pay need, when you need. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You, you need more, you pay more. You need less, you go down. No disturbance, you pay less. Okay. Yeah, and customers that have done this really, really well. I mean, we have a, a key example: uh, a customer in in Italy, Italgas. Their their customer reference of us. Uh, they have created this concept, what they call volume shaping, which is exactly this, this you know, dynamic usage of volume capacity. And that's how they really save a lot of money because in the weekends when they don't have any usage on the, on the platform, they basically scale down and they don't pay for it and they scale up when they need it. Yeah, I like that. And I think um, when I when I look at um, Azure and Adapt Files, I mean, obviously there are some some use cases if I, if I have a huge SAP system, if I need to do a scale out scenario and stuff like that, if I need to have these functionalities, then I think it's a logical choice to use um, Azure and Adapt files. But then um, sometimes when you go to smaller systems, there's the question, well, what, what about the costs? But I think exactly what you just said, that if you look at these dynamic um, modules that I can have, and, and I like this term volume shaping, that, that you really dynamically then can say, um, well, if I need more performance, I think this backup example that you had, Goran, um, also fits there extremely well. If I if I need for a certain period of time, much more throughput, much more um, IOPS, then I can switch it accordingly to this new model, um, which I obviously then need to pay more. But then once I'm done, I, I can reduce um, the the performance, um, the, the the skew again. And then I, I'm running again much, much cheaper. So I think that is something that um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of this, that, that there's really this this huge flexibility on the on the pricing model. Yeah, so I mean, obviously that is something that, uh, let's say the more savvy customers uh, start to learn quickly, right? Because that's that's when they really start making use of the elasticity of the cloud in, in, an, uh, in an effective way. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. That is something that uh, that is a, a lot of uh, adds a lot of value. And then, I mean, it, you can customers can more you know more optimally use the the, the service as well by sharing uh, capacity pools across multiple workloads and you know dynamic uh, uh, change of, uh, of of service levels. Uh, it really allow you to to do a lot of that fancy stuff. And uh, again, the ones that that are the most heavy actually even automate this stuff through uh, you know power power automate or something. I think so, some of the other cool features, and I think you um, mentioned some some of them already, is is uh, the whole backup, snapshotting, the, the cloning, um, the the, the cross-region replication. I think these are some some other cool things 
um, that are part of, of um, Azure NetApp files. Can you talk a little more about these things? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's it. The, the, the people that know, uh, let's say, ONTAP, which is the foundational technology of, of NetApp and, and therefore Azure NetApp files, are very fairly familiar with the advanced you know uh, the advanced way uh, ONTAP does snapshots and does cloning right i mean it's a very advanced way of the how the file system operates which allows for a couple of things it it allows for creating snapshots which don't have a performance impact right which means that uh, you can actually use them the point is if you create a snapshot and you create another snapshot and you create another snapshot and then over time your performance is, uh, you know of your storage degrades then they are pretty much useless now the advantage is here that that doesn't happen with ontap which means that you maintain same level of performance for your mission critical applications but you can create really quick and uh, quick and frequent snapshots right so because you can create frequent snapshots, you can obviously go after very aggressive RPOs, right? Because normally, if you take a backup on a daily yeah. basis, your RPO is, you know, is is one day, uh, 24 hours. But with snapshots, if you can create you know, multiple of them per day, let's say every six hours or even more aggressively every hour, then obviously your RPO can go a, a lot uh, smaller. And you can do that because you don't have the performance impact. Now, not only that, it also allows for immediate restores, right? So imagine if you have a you know a 12 terabyte HANA instance and that thing goes corrupt and you need to restore from your latest snapshots, which you took an hour ago. Not only did you did you not lose so much data, let's say, um, but you can also restore from it instantly. Right, so Azure NetApp Files provides two way of, uh, let's say, restoring snapshots. You can create a new volume out of a snapshot, which you can immediately access. So irrespective of the size, if it's a 12 terabyte HANA instance or a 100 terabyte uh, HPC volume, you can immediately access them. But you can also revert a snapshot, right? So you, in, you can also do an in-place revert in, in inside your same volume. So if you say, you know, I want to recover my database instantly, you can just flip it back in a, in a matter of a minute or less, uh, irrespective of the size. And that obviously not, doesn't only affect your RP, RPO positively, it also affects your RTO uh, uh, positively, right? Because you mm -hmm. can really go after uh, those very, very low, uh, uh, low mission critical enterprise level uh, RPOs. And, and interestingly enough, we also documented this, right? So if you were to go um let me see my browser here oops it's flick flick back for if you go to the azure Net files how azure Net files snapshots work uh, page it, it's got a long section on how does this actually really work right so how does this pointer play with files and, and inodes work and how do how can how can this magic actually actually happen right so how can you actually flip back a volume that fast and what does it look like from a from a consumption standpoint, right? So how can I really uh, see the difference between those snapshots and how much data do I consume? How consume? How fast does it go? How can I actually create snapshots? Can I do it manually or automate it uh, through through policies? Um, how do I use those snapshots for replication, right? Because not only can you create snapshots in a volume, we, you can also replicate those volumes to another region with cross-region mm -hmm. replication including all your snapshots, right? So it's a very efficient way of uh, of your data protection uh, replication to, to a, a DR site. Now, not only that, you can also use Azure Net Files backup, right? So to offload snapshots to, to Vault for long-term retention purposes, for cost savings, uh, and they're really, really advanced as well because it will only replicate, uh, let's say, or offload uh, delta data between snapshots. So it's, it's very efficient uh, as well. So yeah, a lot of content here. I mean, you can read out, uh, read about how how restores work. Uh, you know, how, how do reverts work? Uh, all of that stuff is is really uh, you know thoroughly documented as well. Cool, cool. Very, very impressive. And the the, the cool you know, thing is, you know what's interesting, Holger? Some sometimes customers don't realize it, but you can actually blend in a lot of those functionalities, right? So imagine if you have a uh, test environment or a QA environment, um, because you have the need for it, right? But you also have a DR environment because, yeah, you have the need for it. Then uh, why would you make that two separate environments, right? Why wouldn't you use your DR environment 
for QA as well. Mm -hmm. right? So we have a lot of customers that actually use cross-region replication with those uh, snapshots of replication and, and bring those to another region and use that data for cloning the data sets for test and development purposes, right? So you basically take a snapshot, restore it to a new volume, and off you go for a test dev uh, you know, scenario uh, or a QA scenario, uh, effectively using the DR copy for actual use, right? Because, you know, how many customers live in a DR scenario, you know, 99% of the day? No, no, no other time. Nobody does, right? So it's, it's really something to effectively use. So a lot of customers use that kind of stuff. No, there, there's a really a lot of um, uh, values around it. Performance plus features, uh, which basically enables a different scenario which can be combined. So um, definitely it's a very good value proposition for, for SAP and Azure customers. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I mean, all these things are already available, obviously, that you that you just showed us and um, they're documented. Um, is there anything I yeah, guess there, there's, there's a lot of available. Things. There's still more coming also, but we'll we'll get to that later. Uh, there's, I mean, we're, we're it's a service that's rapidly evolving, right? So there there's a lot more on the let's say on the plan. Uh, we can maybe talk a little bit about it later, but uh, you know, we we have a lot more plans for for the service. Cool. So yeah, what one of the other things you may want to you know I should point out is of course, I mean, snapshots are cool and great and everything. But if you take a snapshot that is not in, in line with your application, not consistent with your application, and obviously they're they're useless, right? So you, you get you know a crash consistent snapshot, which is not effective. Uh, most customers, when they actually use a like a database or HANA or any of that sort, need some consistency for for those snapshots, right? So so that's that's where um, you know AZ AC Snap is the you know the tool that you just you've been uh, made available already in in the HANA large instance uh, world uh, is now also available in uh, with Azure Native Files for for HANA uh, VMs uh, as well on Azure Native Files, right? So. Uh, so, so that really helps you to orchestrate a whole end-to-end, -end, let's say, application consistent data protection mechanism uh, with all the, the integrations into catalogs as well. And, and interestingly enough, uh, we, you know, uh, the preview now is available for AZ Snap that also supports Oracle, right? So it doesn't sure. only support HANA, it now also supports Oracle, right? And, you know, we have, we have more plans in that space coming forward. Cool, cool. So, so I believe we 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 have some follow up sessions here with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's 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 so much more. Um, uh, we talked Coming about cloning. Here. We talked about cross region replication. I mean, uh, we we have we obviously uh, you know, have have more plan more in plan. Um, let's maybe we should talk about a little bit what's new, like what exactly. was recent before we yeah. go into futures. Yes. Um, I think one of the let's say the most interesting. Uh, let's say announcements that we've done uh, recently is um, is is what we call well AZ AC Snap is one of them right, but another one that we've announced recently is uh, something that sounds very very simple, but it's actually fairly advanced, which is called single file snapshot restore, mm -hmm. right? So. We could already do uh, snapshots on volume level. We could already redo restores at the volume level. But sometimes you have a single file that sits inside a volume that you want to restore as well. Now you could already already do that through you know a copy mechanism, right? So you could just go into your snapshot folder, copy the data yeah. out, and then you can restore the file. But if the file is let's say of certain size, let's say a 12 terabyte HANA instance, that copy takes a while, right? So you kind of don't want to pull the data across the network uh, twice uh, to, to get the data recovered. Now we've we've, we've uh, uh, released a tool called single file snapshot restore, which basically allows you to give a file name and have the system restore that file for you in place, mm -hmm. right? So imagine you have a 12 terabyte data file, HANA data file, you only want to restore that file, not everything else. You can now call this operation and the data file gets restored instantaneously to the last version of the snapshot that you chose, right? So that obviously, again, gives a lot of granularity and a lot of uh, improvements in your RTO times uh, for, yeah. for data recovery. Sure. Right? I can script this and, and really say, I need this specific data file um, yeah. in this yeah. folder or whatever, and then yes. this specific file would be 
be stored. Yeah, and it flips it basically in the back end, so it doesn't have to do the data copy for you. It kind of does it uh, automatically for you. And it's again, it's it's documented in this uh, snapshots uh, mm-hmm. how the snapshot work page, how the how this point pointer play works. Uh, but it's it's fairly advanced, and obviously it gives a customer really uh, access to these aggressive uh, SLAs. Mm-hmm. I mean, what what I see a little bit from my limited knowledge of NetApp, I mean, um, there are many of those on-premises feature are one by one coming into Azure NetApp file, like not all yep. of them at once, but they are really coming, right? And that's that's nice to see. So, always- yeah, and that's that's the path, right? So obviously, uh, I mean, ONTAP is very advanced technology, uh, and, and what we're trying to do is is to is to expose, let's say, more and more of this ONTAP technology in an Azure native fashion, right? So it it really is, it follows the same Azure security uh, mechanisms, the, the the ARM integration, right? So you get your own, your ARM APIs, uh, everything is full, it feels, looks full Azure. Now, obviously it's take us, it will take us time to create all this in an, in with an, with an Azure appearance, but certainly that's the direction that we're going uh, to go into. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's, there's more to come. Yeah, the, the the huge benefit there is really, I, I guess, that these are all Azure commands. So I I can um, yeah. just use my um, CLI client to create a virtual machine or to uh, create a load balancer or whatever. But then, following the same patterns, following the same um, structure, I can then also create um, my Azure NetApp files resources and stuff like that. So so it's really a native service on on Azure for this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and that's been the design principle from day one, right? I mean, obviously, that's the that was the goal, and I think it works out really well. Now, now another interesting feature that we've really released specifically for, let's say, the Hana folks uh, that were that are in the podcast, podcast mostly probably 100%, is uh, is a feature called application volume group, mm-hmm. right? So uh, obviously, as you deploy a Hana landscape you need multiple volumes for your landscape. You need your data volume, you need your log volume, uh, you potentially need some shared uh, files volumes, you need uh, your, your backup volume, right? All of that needs to be uh, needs to be deployed. Now, obviously you can go off one and deploy all them manually, but one by one, um, but it's A, it's a lot of work. Uh, B, it doesn't, it's, it's, let's say, potentially error prone because you may miss a few, let's say, optimizations in the process, mm-hmm. right? And also it doesn't necessarily um, let's say lay out your volumes in the storage backend in an optimal fashion, right? Because it doesn't really, if you do stuff manually, it doesn't, you know, the one volume deployment doesn't look after the second volume deployment and you don't get those uh, those optimizations. Now, application volume group does a lot of that in one go, right? So application volume group allows you to basically, uh, it, it's going to ask you a bunch of questions around, about your SAP landscape. And it basically, based on what you enter, create the volumes according to best practices uh, but not only the, let's say, all of the volumes, it also will lay out the volumes in an optimal fashion, and it will potentially even create multiple storage endpoints or IP addresses for performance optimization as well, right? So uh, there's a lot of that, uh, uh, let's say, automation for error, error-free and, and uh, optimized deployments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and thirdly, yeah, yeah, and thirdly, I wanted to finish off. What, what it also does, it integrates with proximity placement groups, right? So it will ensure that your uh, your HANA virtual machines, your m series virtual machines, are in close proximity with the yeah. storage as well to ensure those low latency deployments, low right? Latency. So it's really advanced the technology. Right. So basically, when you say application specific, let's say for the HANA, the storage layout is a bit different than for the Oracle. Yeah, I mean, I mean obviously, it- yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even worse, <laughs> that and you know, Oracle is even different than an HPC landscape or a VDI landscape, right? So we're covering all of these application landscapes, and all of them have their own, let's say, peculiarities of, or optimizations yeah. that that you want to keep in consideration, right? So, I mean, application volume group is uh, for SAP HANA is let's say the first uh, release of this technology. It's the first application uh, that we're supporting uh, with this. Uh, but yeah, and you know, maybe it's a good bridge to to the what's to come. Uh, obviously, in the future, we're looking at expanding application volume groups uh, to other workloads as well. Uh, you know, think about other databases. Think about you know even uh, totally you know totally different applications as well that that will need that optimization. But other databases, other databases. I mean, you are already supporting quite a lot of databases as we as we saw. 
So yeah, you know, Azure Native Files itself obviously supports you know many databases. I mean, you can run SQL Server on Azure Native Files. You can run Oracle on Azure Native Files. You can run uh, you know MySQL. You name them. Uh, pretty much anything that uh, that runs uh, on an NFS uh, mount point kind of works with with Azure Native Files, right? So a lot of that, and we have a lot of that documented, right? But what we what we don't have yet is application volume group, the application ah, volume okay. group feature. Yes, uh, you yes. know, to 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 automate all these optimized deployments, we have that for Hana now, uh, mm -hmm. and and we're looking at uh, expanding that across these other workloads uh, or databases uh, potentially as well that we're that we're looking for. So, so what other things? I mean, you you already mentioned a lot of things that that will also come. What, yeah, what other, I mean, uh, what's a uh, personal highlight for you that you're looking for? A personal highlight, well. Uh, let's put it this way. So uh, Azure Native Files, uh, there are so many highlights. I don't even know where to, <laughs> where to start. Uh, so Azure Native Files historically was built as an as a regional service, right? So it, it's a it's a service, uh, a regional service, and that's how how it started uh, four years ago, five years ago, is when it's designed, and that's also. Uh, let's say how most Azure services were built uh, back in the day. Now, uh, availability zones is an air is an area of uh, increased interest, right? Across all Azure services. Now, that's some some that we're we're, we're going to look at as well, right? So, if you if you look at the the future, then obviously attention towards availability zones and support thereof is is something that we have uh, that we have in mind. Um, other areas is um, you know these automated deployments you know that that I mentioned right so application volume group uh, for Hana is certainly not the last thing that we're gonna that we're gonna offer um, integration of those technologies uh, is is uh, something that we're eyeing uh, I mean if you look at the the snapshot functionality the data protection functionality mm -hmm. uh, the integration with Azure Native Files backup. Um, you know, cloning optimizations. We have a few cloning optimizations in mind that that we can bring to bring forward as well, which which will bring even more value to customers. So let's say a, a lot of this, the, the things. If you look at the previous or the, the initial themes, let's say uh, uh, you know performance, uh, reliability, and high availability, and data management as the as the three pillars of Azure and the Files. In all of those areas, we'll advance uh, the service, right? So we'll, we'll add more and more let's say performance options. We'll add more, uh, you know, reliability and availability options. Uh, we'll add more uh, data management uh, options as well. A full backlog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing, and I mean, if you look at the customer base, it's. Uh, yeah, it's pretty uh, impressive. Uh, I mean, I could show you a few uh, customer reference examples. Uh, let me see if I can quickly find them. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, share my screen. Obviously, I lost my uh, my view my viewpoint now. Um, there it is. So you see my screen, all right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so so one example is, uh, for instance, customer Petrofac, right? I mean, it's an oil and gas company uh, hit by the pandemic back in the day, uh, needed uh, remote work, uh, you know, a quick quick deployment of remote work for remote work, right? So v virtual desktop was all of a sudden very important to them, um, and that's where uh, you know Azure Native Files really helped scale their. Um, you know their Azure Virtual Desktop deployments, right? With uh, FS Logix Profile containers, which require shared storage, right? At scale, right? So that's that's a key example of a workload that's nothing per se to do directly with SAP HANA, but Azure Virtual Desktop, as you know yourself, is is a, is is the is your window into Azure pretty much, right? So we have more and more customers that are going to rely on Azure Virtual Desktop, and Azure Native Files is is a key enabler for for that workload alone. Um, and again, it's just an example. Uh, if we if we move forward a little bit, uh, you know, Repsol, it's another customer mm -hmm. um, that runs an oil and gas uh, simulation, uh, uh, you know, uh, environment on Azure uh, with Azure Native Files, right? So they came from an on-prem world, and uh, basically they they realized that in in Azure they could run their jobs way way faster than they could ever run them on-prem. Right, so massive enabler for a totally different workload than SAP HANA, uh, reservoir simulation. Uh, another customer is Kona, yeah, the Coca-Cola One uh, company, 
I think you know them. One of the you know probably biggest SAP HANA migrations uh, of recent, uh, totally uh, powered by Azure Net Files, right? So scale deployments yes. um, for for Azure Net Files scale out. I think I think was part of this conversation as well. Mm. Um, and then at last but last but not least, uh, I would say SAP HANA or sorry SAP themselves, right? So SAP I think it's an interesting case study uh, where where SAP themselves uh, you know being part of uh, let's say the hack offering. Uh, allows them to go to market faster uh, using Azure Net Files, right? So, I think the the examples are um, are massive, and uh, yeah, it, it's been an interesting ride. I think the, since the last time we spoke, uh, or since the last time you had Ralph in the in the call, um, yeah, we've we have had major we've made major uh, uh, you know moves forward uh, over over the last year. Uh, not only in the technology, uh, but as you can see, also in uh, let's say the deployment and the usage of the service. I mean, for me, this, I mean, you, you showed some some amazing uh, customer examples and um, obviously Kona and, and the others are very, very, are really impressive. But what, what I always like to, to, to point out is is the SAP showcase itself and um, similar like, I mean, what, what we've been saying all along um, when we when we look at SAP at Microsoft, that Microsoft runs SAP, um, SAP runs, um, runs on Azure. Um, and then here you have the, the beautiful um, additional example that also they're also using Azure NetApp files in, in their scenario. So I think that's always a really, really powerful story when you actually see the, the vendor that, that is providing the software to lots of customers and partners that they are also using Azure NetApp files for their, um, for their productive instances there. So I think that's always very impressive. Yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think you can get a better testimony of, of let's say of what you've been trying to achieve right i mean what we've been trying to achieve is migrate unmigratable workloads to azure right and it's a it's a key example uh so yeah I, we couldn't be more happy and prouder than than yeah actually you know having sap on the platform themselves yeah absolutely cool wonderful well great Ed. i think uh, this was a fantastic um, overview a fantastic refresher and also a very interesting outlook on on some of the things that will come. Um, thank you so much for for um, joining us today. Um, I'm I'm sure we'll invite you back. <laughs> to uh, anytime. I mean, if there's any deep dive to be done, I'm also more than happy to bring in our uh, you know our esteemed uh, SAP uh, colleague Bernd into the conversation. You know, he, he's our SAP uh, product manager, I should say, for Azure Data Files. Uh, I mean, he knows more about SAP than than I do. Uh, I know a lot about storage. I know I know a lot about how it integrates into the, all those landscapes, but he's, uh, he's certainly uh, somebody that we could uh, have joined as well. I'll come back to you on that. Perfect. Hey, and uh, again, I, I'm, uh, I'm you know very joyful that you had me. Uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I would love to do it again. And uh, yeah, we will do that. It's, it's, it's been Absolutely. a great, it's been a great talk. Thank you very much, Gerd. Thanks for having you, and uh, we'll see each other again. I'm I'm very sure here on the show. All cool. Right. Ha have a good time Thank and uh, stay safe and healthy. Thank you. You too. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye. -bye.